Okay, it looks like we are on. We're always on. Hallelujah. But we are live now. So welcome to everybody who's watching on Facebook. All those of you who are watching now and who will be watching in the future, whenever, welcome. Um, we are going to be continuing on a subject that we've been on for the past few weeks, talking about um, the significance of the time season that we're in, um, just coming through Passover, just uh, yesterday was Shavuot, and um, we just need to really keep in mind the significance of this time. You know, going back to um, Passover, when we went through the journey through Passover, that this Passover was a very significant Passover, that it was not like other Passovers we've been through. I, I mean, every Passover gets better and better. It's, we're on the ascending cycle. But this Passover was like a connection between the first Passover, the Exodus from Egypt, and the Passover that Yeshua celebrated with the disciples, or wrapped in one. This is the time of the early rain and the latter rain together. And we're seeing a significance in what's playing out in the world, everything that's going on. The nations are in turmoil, the world's in turmoil, but the, the people of God are, it's time for us to rise up, right? So I'm gonna start out by going to Isaiah chapter 58, just to um, give some background to what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and the reason we celebrate the feast, the reason that we are here on Shabbat, just to refresh it in our memories, to refresh it in our conscious thinking uh, why we're here. So Isaiah chapter 58, starting in verse six. Is, the, is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every enslaving yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked that you cover him, and that you hide not yourself from the needs of your own flesh and blood? Then shall your light break forth like the morning, and your healing, your restoration, and the power of a new life shall spring forth speedily. Your righteousness, rightness, justice, and right relationship with God shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and Yahweh will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away from your midst the yokes of oppression, wherever you find them, the finger pointed in scorn and every form of false, harsh, unjust, and wicked speaking. And if you pour out that which with you sustain your own life for the hungry and satisfy the need of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in darkness and your obscurity and gloom become like the noonday. And the Lord shall guide you continuously and satisfy you in drought and in dry places and make strong your bones. And you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of buildings that have laid waste for many generations. And you shall be called repairer of the breach, restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn away your foot, from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor him and it, not going your own way, or seeking or finding your own pleasure, or speaking with your own idle words. Then will you delight yourself in the Lord, and I will make you to ride on the high places of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage promised for you of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Those promises are all wrapped in keeping his commandments and keeping Shabbat. I mean, Shabbat, how many of us, when we started celebrating Shabbat, we found that it was like a supercharge of energy. Mm -hmm. It was like, it was an infusion in our week far more than when we used to worship on Sunday. And there's nothing wrong with worshiping on Sunday, but there's a reason that God said, this is my Sabbath. And right in that first revelation on Mount Sinai, that was one of the first, the first commandments he gave was to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We as a congregation, we as a people, as a camp of influence, we are part of the people that have been keeping that Sabbath. We've been keeping that commandment and we've been keeping it faithfully. And so therefore, we are under the blessing spout, so to speak. We're under that place of blessing 
all the blessings that are attached to, to following the Shabbat, to keeping Shabbat. And some of us, just to remind back, when we first started doing Sabbath, some, quite a few of us in here worked on Saturdays. And we had amazing things that our jobs did in order for us to observe Shabbat. Mm -hmm. Just found from favor. found favor, because we decided to take a stand and honor what the truth was with what the word said. And some of, us, some of us had just amazing, amazing stories, testimonies of the favor that we found because of Yahweh that our jobs did for us. Some, some of us had new positions created so we could have Saturdays off. It's just amazing stuff that took place with employers, with, their, with people in this congregation, and honor of Sabbath. Yep. So, so when we when we follow God's commandments, when we follow the Torah, there's blessings attached to it. You know, we, we read um, Deuteronomy 28 where it talks about the blessings if you obey and the curses if you don't. And there's there's a reason for it. Yahweh knows what He's doing. He knew it from the beginning. He knows how to keep things going. He knows how how you were formed. You know, like he said to Job, you know, did you create yourself? Did, you know, have you, have you tied up the bounds of the stars and called them all by their names? No. You know, he is the one who set it in being, so he knows how to do it, and he knows how to do it best. Um, so we got to keep that in mind, that, like we were talking the other night on Shavuot, about the, the biggest reason that the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt was to come to this place of Mount Sinai to get the revelation of how to walk in their promised land. It wasn't like, okay, I've redeemed you from Egypt and now here you go, here's your promised land. They probably would have destroyed it within the first week because they weren't trained, they weren't prepared, they didn't know how to, how to walk as his people anymore. They had been slaves in Egypt for over 400 years and a lot of stuff can get lost. Look at, just look at where we are in our nation mm -hmm. after not even 400 years that we've been a nation. Mm -hmm. Um, it's easy to let go of things through the generations. So when, when he's, he spoke his promise and his covenant to Abraham and said, this land I give to you and your descendants forever, that was an everlasting covenant. They broke it, and then they, were, they ended up being multiple times sent out of the land. But um, the original purpose was that this is their land, and this is the promise that they're supposed to walk in. And this is, these are the commandments and if you do this, you'll be blessed. And if you don't do it, you'll be cursed. Not because he's going to say, I'm going to curse you. The curse is already attached to not following it. Um, so just to kind of refresh what we were talking about the other night, in Exodus chapter 19, um, in verse, um, starting at verse 3, Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him out of the mountain, Say this to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will keep my voice in truth and obey my voice in truth and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own peculiar possession and treasure from among, among and above all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation set apart to the worship of God. This was the purpose. This is how he introduces it on Mount Sinai. This is a covenant. He's a covenant God. Throughout the word, just look up how many times it says the word covenant in the Bible. And it starts it out right in, right in Genesis when it says with Noah. That was the first covenant he made with Noah that I will, not, I will not flood the earth again. And he set the sign of his covenant as the rainbow in the sky. And throughout the word, he has these marks that he definitely states, I am setting a covenant. Um, Judges 2, 1 says, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land which I swore to give to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. How many of you know that? God never breaks his covenant. He keeps his word. He never breaks it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So with that being said, because we're talking about covenant, and one of the things during Shavuot, one of the books that they read, um, mostly during Shavuot is, and Jordan touched on it the other night, was the Book of Ruth. So we are going to go on another journey as we continue through our journey of Shavuot. And we are going to look at actually um, two relationships that exemplified covenant. And so 
We're going to go on this journey, and we're going to start this journey first with Ruth and Naomi, and then we're going to continue, end, continue on the journey and end it with the story of David and Jonathan. Um, you know, when you, when you hear of covenant relationships like that, to me, the three most prevalent examples of this type of covenant intimacy that stand out in the Bible are the relationship between Ruth and Naomi, between David and Jonathan, and between Yeshua and John. But we're going to focus on um, the journey with Ruth and Naomi and David and Jonathan. And so with, with both of them, but like I said, we're going to start with Ruth and Naomi. Their journey tells a journey of faith, of loyalty, of commitment, and of dedication and devotion between two people, but also between two people and their God. And the same as that we come around to the story of Shavuot with Moses and Yahweh that day at Mount Sinai. So it's a story of a bonding of deep connection and love, an example of faith and trust in each other and in their faith and trust in Yahweh. And this also, this covers with David and Jonathan also. I think, and like I said, the only other powerful examples of this was in the word of this type of covenant relationship is Ruth and Naomi, David and Jonathan, and Yeshua and John. But it's a covenant between two women and a covenant between two men based on an unfailing strength and trust with each other. You know that Ruth had to have had such a, a trust and faith in Naomi to do what she did. And we're going to actually go to Ruth chapter 1. There's, we got a lot of scriptures we're going to be saying, reading today. So we're going to go through that story. But just the powerful examples of what you see between these two women who were a, a, um, a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, and between two men who actually weren't even related. They were friends, you know, so to and speak. And actually would have been rivals. Actually, yeah, definitely. Jonathan would have been in line to the throne. Exactly. Not David. Did not David, yeah. So, so uh, let's turn to Ruth chapter 1. We're going to start there. We're going to read the story of the beginning. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem of Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he, his wife, and his two sons. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and his two sons were named Palon and Chilion. They were Ephraites from Bethlehem of Judah. They went to the country of Moab and continued there. But Elimelech, who was Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Oprah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They dwelt there about 10 years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. So the woman was bereft of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughter-in-laws to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in Moab how the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she left the place where she was, her two daughter-in-laws, with her, and they started on the way back to Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find a home and rest, each in the house of her husband. Then, they, then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that, I may become your, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband tonight and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it is far more bitter for me than for you that the hand of the Lord has gone out. And then they wept aloud again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. And that's a key thing in this, because you'll see it with David and Jonathan also. Ruth clung to her. And Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Urge me not to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. That's covenant mm -hmm. right there. 
if anything but death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said no more. So they both went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred about them and said, is this not Naomi? And she said to them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara. And I went out I went out full, but the Lord has brought me home again. Why call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth and the, Mo the Moab, Moab her daughter-in-law, <laughs> with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Which is Shavuot. Shavuot is the barley harvest. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I just thought it was interesting, too, when it talks about, you know, they went to Moab. We don't know the reasons for them going to Moab. Uh, well, we know the reason. It was because of the famine in the land. But we don't know if the, it was the Lord leading them to Moab. Mm -hmm. don't, we don't know that part. It doesn't disclose that. What we do know about Moab is that the Moabites were a people who were told that they could never be in covenant with God. That they, the Israelites were told, don't marry the Moabites. Don't you know, have any part in them. They were cut off and cursed people, and, and it said to the thousandth generation, the Moabites have no place in the covenant of God. Very interesting to them. Definitely, to yeah. So when you look at this whole relation, covenant relationship between Ruth and Naomi, and you'll see it with David and Jonathan, and it all goes back to, to Shavuot, we see some key things here. Um, you know, with, with, with Ruth and Naomi, the servant's heart, that servant's heart that she displayed to Naomi and the submission to Naomi, she was so sold out to her mother-in-law that no matter what, she was going to stay w with her mother-in-law. And there's so many nuggets that we can pull out of these two relationships. So we have things where it comes with the servant's heart and submission. We'll, we'll see another example of where in both relationships where they forsook their family, which ties back to what took place with Moses and the Israelites with Shavuot. We'll see the determination, the dedication, and the devotion between Ruth and Naomi and David and Jonathan. The commitment to each other, well, actually more so the commitment of Ruth to Naomi. You know, this more so looks at Ruth towards Naomi. And the commitment she had, the loyalty, the faith, the intimacy, and the strength. All key points between a powerful, powerful covenant. She was willing to leave her entire family, her entire people, an entire nation, go to a land that she didn't know about because of Naomi. She was willing to leave all her other gods behind. Moabites had a lot of gods. She was willing to leave all that behind and said that your God will be my God. That was the key point in there. Exactly. So if you look at Ruth chapter 2, and it talks about how you know Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of wealth, and it starts to talk about the story of Boaz. And so if you jump down from chapter 2 to verse 11, and if this is when Boaz and Ruth have met each other for the first time, and Boaz said to her, I have been made fully aware of all you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and mother in the land of your birth and have come to a people unknown to you before. The Lord recompense you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, mm -hmm. under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Yes. Then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken to the heart of your maidservant though I am not as one of your maidservants. And so with this being said, you know, we're talking about how examples of forsaking their family. And this is, a, like Jordan was just saying, what a powerful, powerful key to how Ruth left everything behind. She left everything behind for Naomi, but ultimately who was she leaving everything behind for? It was to follow after Naomi's God because she knew that was the way. You know, in, um, was it Yeshua says in one of the Gospels about if you don't leave mother or father or brother or sister no and follow me, yeah. you'll have no part of me? You know, I think it's probably safe to say that along that lines of those scriptures, many of us in here have made decisions along that lines mm -hmm. to leave what was from behind, to leave family, to leave father and, and, and mother and brother and sisters, you know, leave a land that we were familiar and comfortable with, to go mm -hmm. to a land that was not yet known, you know, to leave a land that we were so used to and, and seemed right, 
seem to be giving us the blessings, seem to be giving us what we really need, where in actuality it wasn't. And you know, many of us in here have different stories of that, where we have made that decision to go forth and go into a land that has been unknown, and to go into this family for a reason. And why was that? Because what of all of our, us in here, all of our hearts ultimately seek after? It's Yahweh. It's Yeshua. Same as, same as Ruth and Naomi. And you know, and we'll see that a little later on with, with David and Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, interesting too, that whole part about leaving what seems like it's good. You, it, there's a lot of things in the world that the world might have that seem attractive, that may seem like you, you're popular, may seem like you're, you have it all going for you, but says that there's a way that seems right before man, but at the end of it is death. You know, and in and, and the Psalms, David talks about, you know, I saw the prosperity of the wicked, and I said, why is the wicked flourishing, and why do they seem like they have it all together and all that? But then I went to the sanctuary of God, and I saw their end, for they perish in suffering, and it goes through that whole thing. There's a lot of things, like I said, and Yahweh can see it more than we can. We can't always see behind the veil <laughs> of what we might, it might look good and we say, oh, that's what I really want. What we want is what Abba wants for us. What we want is Yahweh's will for our lives. That should be what we want because that is what will ultimately give us the most long-term fulfillment. Ruth didn't know what was gonna happen at the end of the story. Exactly. When she committed to Naomi, it looked like she was signing herself up to, okay, I'm just gonna have Naomi and that's all I have, I'm gonna have in my life. But to her, that was a better option than turning around and going back to Moab. It was a better option than turning back and saying, I'm gonna go serve my old gods, I'm gonna go back to my old life and my old people and all that. Because she had to have seen something in Naomi that said, I want what you have. Mm -hmm. I want your God. I want to serve him, and I want to be with you. And that commitment and loyalty to Naomi is what opened Ruth up to the blessing to bring her and Naomi both into what they came into with Boaz. Yeah. And, and the whole thing with, you know, going back to when Ruth said to Naomi, like you were just starting to touch on, for where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Those are powerful words in themselves right there. But to go on further to say, where you die, I will die, mm -hmm. that's a life commitment. Yep. This, is, this is her saying to, to Naomi, mm -hmm. you know what? I'm in this to the end with you. I am so committed and loyal and, 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 and devoted to you that I am in this to the end no matter what. Right. For I will die, for where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. There will I be buried with you. Not there will I be buried back in my homeland, mm -hmm. back where my family has their plot up on the hill right. with all their names on their stones, <laughs> not on the family plot, yep. but with Naomi. Right. I will be buried with you, and the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. Mm -hmm. So Ruth is making a declaration to Naomi, but to all of heaven and to all of hell. I am saying right now that nothing will separate you and I, the only thing that will separate me from you is death. Mm -hmm. And that is so, so powerful. powerful. What a powerful, powerful example of, of covenant. And, and when she goes on to, you know, Naomi is the leader, you know, Ruth's leader, and the, the submission to her as that leader, and, and, and then uh, Ruth's attitude towards that. So Naomi is leading her on this journey that Ruth is now embarking on with Boaz. And Naomi is the one in the, in, the, in the gear, so to speak, with this whole thing. And she's directing Ruth's steps one by one on how to do this thing properly. I don't think properly. initially Naomi saw it either. Because no, you nope. see what she said when she came back from Moab. You know, don't call me Naomi. God's made my life bitter. No, yeah, God bitter didn't do it. Took it from God me. didn't do it. That's the, that's the one thing that she didn't have exactly. a knowledge of. She didn't have the knowledge that it wasn't Yahweh that made your life bitter. You went to Moab. Your family went to Moab. Whatever decisions her husband made had set these things in motion. It wasn't God that did it to her. Yeah, so her sights weren't anywhere on right. what Yahweh could do But I think do she began to Ruth. see it as it started playing out. Exactly. She said, okay, this was the plan. 
all along. And the plan but was going to be fulfilled. For evil. Yahweh turns around for good. Right. And the plan would be fulfilled as long as Ruth lined up with Naomi to the plan. Mm -hmm. What if Ruth didn't have these characteristics of being submitted to her, being a servant's heart, being so loyal and, and devoted to her? What if Ruth was just like, eh, you're an old lady. You don't know nothing. <laughs> I'm going to go do things my way. None of this, sto this story would have had a completely, totally different ending. And this is the most powerful stories because it all comes back to the lineage of Yeshua. She ended up and, in the in Moabites. Exactly. Somebody outside of the covenant of God with no share in the covenant ended up being grafted into the covenant and became in the line lineage of our Messiah. Exactly, exactly. I mean, she got blessed above being blessed. Right, but if she had just decided to do her own thing, you know, and not listen to Naomi, and because mm -hmm. she was a young woman, she was a young, beautiful woman, you know, mm -hmm. and, and Boaz was much older than her. He says you know? that at one point. Yeah, he's, he's like, like I'm, gone after I'm so much one. older. Yeah, why didn't you go after somebody younger? Mm -hmm. but, not, but Ruth saw beyond the natural. Mm -hmm. She saw beyond the natural, and she saw in Naomi and knew the wisdom and knew that Naomi was going somewhere with us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the two of them, that powerful relationship between the two of them, they just connected like this, mm -hmm. and they walked it out together with Ruth being submitted and under Naomi, and, a, and for this amazing, amazing blessing to take forth with Boaz, which, took pla which, which ended up taking care of, with, of Naomi and Ruth, mm -hmm. and then Ruth and Boaz having a child together. Yeah. But then the powerful statement that, that Ruth makes to Naomi in chapter 3, in verse 5, and here we go talking about the, the dedication and the devotion she had, but also the submission. Because she says in chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 to Ruth, I mean to Naomi, and Ruth said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful statement in itself. Yeah. Now, is there many people in here that you would say to them, all that you say to me, I will do? Nah, no, no, nope, definitely not. But if you, trust them. if you trust them and you know that you know and you've got covenant with them, and then Ruth knew that about Naomi. Mm -hmm. So that's a powerful, powerful statement to make to somebody. Mm -hmm. All that you say to me, I will do. So what ends up happening? Ruth, she goes down to the th threshing floor, and she did just as her mother-in-law had told her to do. Mm -hmm just as her mother-in-law. She didn't sway a little detail. Oh, well, Naomi told me to lie six feet past his feet, you know? She did exactly what Naomi told her to do, and that was opened up for the amazing, amazing account of this story to unfold. Mm -hmm. And very interesting that the statement, all that you say to me, I will do. In Exodus 24, it says that when, when the... Um, in 24 verse 7 it says Moses took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people book of the covenant read it in the hearing of the people and, he, and they said all that the Lord has said we will do mm -hmm. and we will be obedient same words as it all spoke. connects right back it's all caught, connects back to the covenant exactly and with 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 Ruth being this obedient to Naomi and everything that she walked out in. I mean, that's amazing trust. Mm -hmm. You've got to have an amazing trust with somebody, especially when it comes into, you know, you know, Ruth is about to partake into a relationship with Boaz. That's an amazing trust right there, to be trusting Naomi step by step yep. to be doing this with Boaz. But even it's noticed by, it's, it's noticed by Boaz. It is. Boaz is like, okay, there's something about this Ruth, mm -hmm. and it's because of Naomi, mm -hmm. but there's something about this Ruth, because when you look further down in verse 10, and um, when, he, when he wakes up and says to who are you, and she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Spread your wing over your maidservant, for you are a next of kin. And he says to Ruth, blessed be you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have made this last loving kindness greater than the former. Mm -hmm. So he's recognizing in Ruth, mm -hmm. that this, what this, she's actually doing here, mm -hmm. you know, and it all goes back to the submission and the connection and the intimacy between her and Naomi. You can't have a covenant without intimacy. You know, there can't, you can't. Mm -hmm. You know, a covenant is such a, such a strong, powerful thing, and it's lifelong. You enter into covenant with somebody, you're in it, you know, like we mm -hmm. just said earlier, you're in it to the end. Mm -hmm. It's not some light thing, oh, I strike a covenant with you, but I can go and break it mm -hmm. another time. You know, covenant in, is eternal. In the, somewhere in 
I'm not recalling where it is right now, but if you break covenant, you're supposed to be stoned to death. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's a serious thing. They took covenant very, very seriously in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, this is just an amazing thing. And you compare that. So you, you line up the story of um, Ruth and Naomi, and you line it up with the children of Israel in, in, at Mount Sinai and moving forward from there. Mount Sinai, they said, all the Lord has said we will do, and we will be, be obedient. Well, we know that their heart was in the right place, but as they went along on their journey, they didn't necessarily follow it entirely. And thus, they ended up not trusting fully. That was the biggest thing. They didn't trust in their, their covenant partner. They didn't really have a, a deep-seated trust in Yahweh because they kept questioning, well, he provided water for us miraculously out of a rock, but can he give us food? You know, so they kept questioning the relationship. They kept questioning the trust. And therefore, ultimately, it ended up delaying their being able to receive the promise for 40 years. Mm -hmm. What if Ruth had had that in her, that she couldn't completely trust Naomi, and it took a while to and, and end up delaying? Well, she couldn't have delayed it 40 years, and Boaz probably Boaz would have been dead. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, he was an older man, yeah. you know? So, so there's some things where in your life, you don't have 40 years to waste. You don't have that time to, I'm gonna wander in the wilderness and then finally get back to the path that God has originally called me to. We don't have 40 hours to waste anymore. In the times we're in, you don't even have 40 hours because it could be over by then. We are in the end of the end days. And it's time for us to be like Ruth and say, all you say to me, I will do. I'm not going to go to the right. I'm not going to go to the left. I'm going to follow your words, and I'm going to keep your covenant. Because one degree off could have changed everything. You know, mm -hmm. just like Dad talks about when flying a plane. This when flying a plane. You know, when you're flying a plane, you you best be listening to the air con air traffic controller when he's giving you directions mm -hmm. on what to do. And follow those instruments. You know, and you follow those instruments and you follow things precisely. Because one degree off. And, you know, I'm just, this is just an example. I don't know this. I'm just, you know, making an illustration. But your, you know, your destination is you're heading to Hawaii. But you, you know, the, 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 you're following the instruments, the same one thing, and the controller's telling you something. But you just decide, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right to me or something. And you just go one degree off, and you're no longer ended in Hawaii. You're in, heading towards China, okay? That's a very vast destination to be going. So, and even in a story like this, you know, if Ruth hadn't been pre precisely following Naomi every step of the way, but covenant is two parts. Covenant's not just one-sided. Covenant is two-sided. So Naomi had to have been hearing Holy Spirit through that. Exactly. And Naomi had to have a trust in Ruth. Mm -hmm. Naomi had to know within herself, know that she know, knew I know that if I tell Ruth to do this, she'll do it. Mm -hmm. I know that I know. Ruth is so sold out to me. She's so loyal and devoted to me. I don't even have to think twice. I know no matter what I tell Ruth to do, you know, by illustration only, if I told Ruth to jump off a bridge, she'd probably do it for me. Mm -hmm. She was so sold out that she knew, and that was trust on Naomi's part. Mm -hmm. And it was a knowing in her towards Ruth. And it was the two part of the covenant, because you can't have a one-sided covenant. There's two parts, two parts to relationship. Mm -hmm. You can't have a one-sided relationship. You know, what it would be like if you're in relationship with somebody, and here you are, two people, you know, whether it's husband or wife or, or you know, friend and friend or whatever, and the one part is the only one that only ever talks, and the other one just sits there and doesn't say a word. Or the one part is the only one that ever, you know, ever does anything, and the, other, the second part, it's like blah, nothing. Is that even a relationship? That's not. That's not, and that's far from covenant, far from covenant. So relationship, covenant is a two-way thing, just like a relationship with Yahweh. It's not Yahweh constantly pouring into us and talking to us and blessing us. It's the anything. reversal. It's two-part. It's supposed to be us seeking after him every day also mm -hmm. and spending time with him and communing in with him and just the being his presence you know not necessarily even going to him and say you know Yahweh I'm coming to you today because I have a bill that needs to be paid mm -hmm. no Yahweh I am coming to you to you today I'm not asking for a thing because you know what I know everything's already taken care of mm -hmm. I know all is well I'm coming with you 
just to be with you, mm -hmm. just to sit with my daddy and spend time with you, to fellowship and talk to you, you know, just one-on-one, -on -one, like you'd be talking one-on-one -on -one with a friend. Mm -hmm. How's it going today, you know? Just that type of covenant relationship. Mm -hmm. And so with that story with Ruth and Naomi, you know, we see that story between two women. We see that story between a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. And so now, you know, we can probably turn it over and slide over onto David and Jonathan, another example of a powerful, powerful covenant. And actually, David and Jonathan are the ones that most of the time you hear, you know, when somebody's talking about covenant or a relationship, they always refer back to David and Jonathan. And these were two, two men who weren't even related, weren't even, like Jordan said, you know, Jonathan was the one that was going to be in line under Saul. He was Saul's son. David wasn't Saul's son. He was Saul's son. So if we look at first Samuel. But he ended up knowing that David had been the one chosen. Exactly. And it didn't, it didn't make him, he didn't have a jealousy about it. He wasn't it. offended. He wasn't offended. He wasn't like, that's my rightful place. And no, they, he accepted it. What this did is, he do? This is God's plan, and I'm going to line up with it. Exactly. And he came right alongside David. And helped him. He came right alongside David as strength and encouragement, yep. that what he needed, and that's covenant that all comes back to what covenant is mm -hmm. so if we look at chapter uh, first samuel chapter 18 and we're going to start at verse one <clears throat> so and it's the story about you know david and jonathan and and saul and stuff and so when david had finished speaking to saul the soul of jonathan was knit with the soul of david and jonathan loved him as his own life there we go again right back to covenant. You know, where Naomi, where Ruth said to Naomi, where you die, I will die, and I will be buried with your people. Well, here it is, Jonathan saying to him, you know, he loved him as his own life. He loved David as his very own life. And that's a powerful thing also. You know, how, how many of us would be, be saying, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love, love you as much as I love my own life. I'm willing to go over my life for your life. You know, how many of us are in that type of a position, type, that type of relation or covenant where we know that we know we would stand up and be like, you know what, by illustration only, if it came down to it between me and you, I'll die in order to save you. I'll die in order to protect you. Mm -hmm. And that's what you see here with David and Jonathan. And I believe in the same exact with Ruth and Naomi. And it's Ruth would have done that to Naomi. It's a pattern of Yeshua. Exactly. It's the pattern of what Yeshua did for us. Because he loved us so much and wanted to be in covenant with us. He said, I'll die for you. So then we go continue on verse 2. So Saul took David that day and not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own life. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor, even his sword, his bow, and his girdle. That was a powerful sign back then of exchange, of, of going into covenant with someone, with that exchanging, exchanging. of them. Yep. And, with, and even more powerful that Jonathan gave him his actual armor. That was a big, big, big mm -hmm. thing in those times when you gave somebody your armor. There's always an exchange in covenant. Exactly. Always a two-way thing. Yep. And so Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David in his armor, even his sword, his bow, and his girdle. And David went out, and wherever Saul sent him, and he, pros and he prospered and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and it was satisfactory both to the people and to Saul's servants. As they were coming home when David returned from killing the Philistines, the women came out of all the Israelite towns singing and dancing to meet King Saul with timbrels, songs of joy, and instruments of music. And the women responded as they laughed and frolicked, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry, for the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have ascribed only thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul jealously eyed David from that day forward. The next day an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul, and he raved madly in his house while David played with his hand as at other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. And David evaded him twice. Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him, but it departed from Saul. So Saul removed David from him and made him his commander over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. 
David acted wisely in all his ways and succeeded, and the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how capable and successful David was, he stood in awe, in awe of him. So then I just want to jump over, because I'm just trying to lay out the story of what happened to put David into this position with Jonathan, and ultimately it became what happened between David and Saul. Saul is now actually going after David's very life and is out to, out to get David. So then if we go to um, chapter 19, and, is, and here shows you the commitment of Jonathan towards David. So now Saul told Jonathan his son and all his servants that they must kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And he told David, Saul, my father, is seeking to kill you. Now therefore, take heed to yourself in the morning and stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will converse with my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his, David, against his servant David, for he has not sinned against you, and his deeds have been of good service to you. For he took his life in his hands and slew the Philistine, and the Lord wrought a great deliverance for all Israel. You, shaw, you saw it and rejoiced. Why then would you sin against innocent blood and kill, David, and kill David without a cause? Saul heeded Jonathan and swore, as the Lord lives, David shall not be slain. So Jonathan called David and told him all these things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence and in times past. So there it shows again about the family. Jonathan was more committed to David than he was to his father Saul because of the covenant relationship that he had entered into with David. And he was willing to do whatever to protect David, to make sure nothing happened to David from the hands of his own father. And that's just another powerful thing where it shows the commitment between two individuals, this covenant that covers the loyalty that Jonathan had towards David the, the submission, so to speak, that Jonathan had towards David, the devotion that he had, that Jonathan had towards David. And it just all underlines with that whole thing. And so to finish, kind of complete the story so we get the full picture of everything, if you go to chapter 20, and, um, and it says, and we're going to start at verse 1, and David fled from Nioth in Ramah and came and said to Jonathan, What have I done? Of what am I guilty? What is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And Jonathan, Jonathan said, God forbid you shall not die. My father does nothing great or small but what he tells me, or, or but what he tells me. And why should he hide this thing from me? It is not so. But David replied, Your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he thinks, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever you desire, I will do for you. And we see it again, just like what we saw in, with Ruth and Naomi and what Jordan was just talking about a few minutes ago. Jonathan says to David, Whatever you say, I will do this for you. And so, um, and so Jonathan says, Far be it from you if I knew that evil was determined for you by my father, would I not tell you? Then David said to Jonathan, Will you tell me if your father answers you roughly? Jonathan said, Come, let us go into the field. So they went into the field. Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be my witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day, behold, if he is well inclined toward David and I do not send and let you know it, then the Lord do so, and much more to Jonathan. But if it please my father to do you harm, then I will disclose it to you and send you away, that you may go in safety. And may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. While I am still alive, you shall not only show me the loving kindness of the Lord, so that I die not, but, you, but also you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not even when the Lord has cut off every enemy of David from the face of the earth. So David made a covenant with the house of so Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, And the Lord will require that this covenant be kept at the hands of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again by his love for him, for Jonathan loved him as he loved his own life. <clears throat> you see that, what, three times now, where Jonathan has said he loves David 
as he loves his own life. And just that, that powerful commitment between two, two men who, like I said, weren't even related, weren't even friends or anything like that, just a strong, strong devotion to each other. And, and again, when Jonathan's talking about his father, you know, he's going to tell David what the plans of his own flesh and blood are against his covenant, his covenant friend, I guess you would That's call it. he's forsaking his, his father's house. Exactly. He's saying, okay, my, my house is going to be different than my father's house. I'm making a covenant with David's house for my family. That's when he left his family behind. Exactly. And, and then it goes down further to, to bring a, a kind of an ending here to David and Jonathan. So then the story continues to unfold, and, you know, they sit at the dinner, and, and, you know, Saul notices that David's seat is empty the first day, but really doesn't think too much about it. But then the second day notices David's seat is empty again, so he inquires of Jonathan. So Jonathan says to him, well, we know that I gave him permission. He asked me if he could leave to go to Bethlehem to be with his family. And so what happens in verse 30? Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. He said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother who bore you for as long as the son of Jesse lives upon the earth you shall not be established nor shall your kingdom so now send and bring him to me for he shall surely die and Jonathan answered Saul his father why should he be killed what has he done be, what has he done but Saul cast his spear at him to smite him by which Jonathan knew that his father had determined to kill David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food that second day of the month, for he grieved for David because his father has disgraced him. So then in the morning he goes and hears the story of the lad and shooting the arrows and said and, and stuff, and he tells David what's gone on with his father. And so they end it with 41 and 42. And as soon as the lad was gone, David arose from beside the heap of stones and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times. And they kissed one another and wept with one another until David got control of himself. That's actually a powerful, powerful scripture right there. Powerful scripture. They, they hugged and they kissed each other and wept until David got control of himself. And Jonathan told David, go in peace, for as much as we have sworn to each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord shall be between me and you, between my descendants and yours forever. And Jonathan arose and departed into the city. Forever. Another, this is covenant. We're in this to the end. We're in this till death, death do us part, death does us part, however you say it. We're in this to the end together. Right? And we see that that ended up being carried out by David toward Mephibosheth. Exactly. He kept his covenant with Jonathan even after Jonathan had died. And it was, it was, it was an eternal covenant. Exactly. And what happened in that story with, his, with, um, with Jonathan's son? You know, Jonathan's son was lame, you mm -hmm. know, from birth, couldn't walk and stuff. And when he hears that David's looking for him, what is his first reaction? Oh, no. Oh, no, he's coming to find me because he's going to kill me. Yeah. His whole reaction and stuff of like that. What was that on David? He didn't David's know end? he was in covenant. He didn't know he was in he covenant. He didn't know with he had father. a covenant. And that, you know, that whole story right there with, with Jonathan's son shows you the strength and the power behind that covenant that David and Jonathan had. Now, David uh, is now a powerful man, mm -hmm. and he is not going to break that covenant no matter right. what. And he goes seeking because he's like, if there's one left in the mm -hmm. house of Jonathan, if there's mm -hmm. one, how can I show favor to my covenant friend who's, mm -hmm. who had been killed? Jonathan had been killed, obviously, because this whole story comes about with his son. How can I show favor and continue on with the house of David? There's got to be just one that's left. Yep. And his servant comes to him and says, well, there's Jonathan's son who's been lame since birth and lives in Lodabar and all that. And David goes and searches for him. And he takes Jonathan's son from nothing, from, you know, not totally lame, not having anything, poverty, not knowing life really, taking him and placing him at the table with David. Right. Powerful, powerful emphasis on that covenant mm -hmm. between David and Jonathan. And even after Jonathan's gone, but Jonathan knew 
Jonathan had a knowing within David. I really believe Jonathan had a knowing within David that if anything happened to him, he knew that no matter what, David was not going to forsake that covenant. Mm -hmm. No matter what, David was not going to come after his own house sure. because sure. of how powerful that covenant was that they had made between each other on that day. Mm -hmm. when, when Jonathan turned his back, so to speak, on his father and said, no, I'm going to protect you. Mm -hmm. And it all established from, from right there. And that's, a, that's such a picture of how Yahweh is with his covenant with us. You know, he, he said that he keeps covenant to a thousand generations. A thousand generations. We haven't even had a thousand generations on this earth. He keeps his covenant to a thousand generations. And the powerful part about that is even when somebody in that thousand generations doesn't know that they have a covenant. They don't know the covenant that their forefathers made with them. Mm -hmm. He's still keeping his covenant. And you know, how many times has, has the pastor, has dad said about how many of us don't know that we may have had a praying great, great grandmother. And that's the reason why we are where we are exactly. today. It's because she had a covenant with God and she prayed for her her children, you know, like the blessing song, yeah. may be upon, his favor be upon you and your children and their children. A thousand you know, generations. To a thousand generations. Such a powerful thing. In Isaiah 54, 10, it says, for though the mountains should depart and though the hills be shaken or removed, yet my love and kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace and completeness be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on so just to go back to what Jordan was just saying and, and back to the whole thing with, with the covenant with God in, in the thousand generations, you know, we look at where, you know, Moses was there that day on Mount Sinai and the words were given from Yahweh to him. And these are my words for you to do. These are my commands for you to do. This is my covenant with you that I will not break or ever alter. Right. And he sent them forth back to the Israelites to impart these words to them to carry out the what covenant. you're just saying, carry out the covenant for all these generations, yeah. all the way up to where we come to right now mm -hmm. today, or those of us standing here in this room, in this sanctuary, the presence of the Most High God on May 30th, 2020. Mm -hmm. And it says, you know, the rabbis talk about how the covenant made at Mount Sinai was a marriage covenant. It was a ketubah. It was God saying, you know, I'm bringing you out here. You're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. And the Israelites were to forsake all others. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we know that when you get married, you're supposed to forsake all others. You're not supposed to have, okay. I'm going to keep all these people on the side. I'm going to get, he said, I'm, I'm to be your God and you're to have no other gods before me. And that's why he kept saying, you know, when you get into the land that you're coming to possess, you're going to drive out the inhabitants before you. Don't make any covenant with them or with their gods for I am the Lord your God. Exactly. He was very strong about that. And that ultimately was the reason that they ended up being exiled from the land. He takes breaking covenant very seriously, Definitely. very seriously. And um, I was going to Deuteronomy. There's a verse that I read last night. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter five, Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances which I speak in your hearing this day, that you may learn them and take heed and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made this covenant not with our fathers, but with us who are all of us here alive this day. So he's, he's bringing that covenant that was made, it goes through the generations. And now he's reiterating it to them and saying, he, he goes through the whole, you read Deuteronomy chapter five, six, seven. He's reiterating the words that were spoken on Mount Sinai. This is later, he's gonna, he's telling them, this is what he told you to do. This is what he told you to keep. He's trying to get them to follow it and all that. And now as they're getting ready to head into the promised land, this is, this is their, this is their marriage covenant. This is, okay, this is what you're going to do now. Exactly. And throughout the scriptures, it was always a story of he's giving you his covenant. He's asking you to follow it. Man breaks the covenant. They leave him. And he's always going to buy you back and bring you back into covenant with him. 
Um, Hosea. Hosea, you know, Hosea is the ultimate story and, and God chose it as that. He told Hosea to go get a woman, get married to her, and then she left him and, and went after other, other men. And he told him, go and buy her back because this is a picture of how I am going to be to Israel. In, I, in uh, Hosea, let me see if I find it. Hosea chapter 2, and then we're going to show a quick video that kind of caps this off. But Hosea chapter 2, Hosea chapter 2, starting in verse 14, he's speaking, after, speaking Yahweh's speaking about Israel in this verse. He said, that before, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness. Again, going back into the wilderness, back where we started. It's like remembering the heights where you fell from, remembering your first love. I'm going to recapture that. Bring you into the wilderness, and I will speak tenderly into her heart. There I will give her vineyards and make the valley of Achor troubling to be for her a door of hope and expectation. And she shall sing there and respond as in the days of her youth and as at the time when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, you will call me Ishi, my husband, and you will no more call me Baali, my Baal. For I will take the names of the Baalim, the Baals, out of her mouth, and they shall no more be mentioned or seriously remembered by their name. That's a total cleansing mm -hmm. of everything that she had done in the past. It's a total He's her kinsman redeemer here. He's buying her back and saying, I'm bringing you back into covenant with me. Even though she didn't, Israel didn't deserve to be brought back into the covenant with him, even though she had broken the covenant, he says, I'm buying you back. And in that day, I'll make a covenant for Israel with the living creatures of the open country and the birds of the heavens. I'll break the bow and the sword and abolish battle equipment and conflict out of the land. And I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will even betroth you to me in stability and in faithfulness. And you shall know that uh, you shall know the Lord. So, I mean, that gives the ultimate picture of restoration to the covenant. Mm -hmm. Even after breaking the covenant, this is what you're going to be. And you will be betrothed to me. And you're going to be faithful this time. Shows his, co his, his confidence in exactly. us. It shows his faithfulness in us. His faithfulness. In his, in his love for us. You know, as we continue on this journey, you know, we're coming out of, out of Shavuot, but we're still continuing on a journey. You know, we're, we're going from a, a level to level to level, higher and higher and higher. And as we've been on this journey in seeing these different aspects between Ruth and Naomi and David and Jonathan and and Moses and what happened on Mount Sinai and what Jordan was talking about with the marriage covenant. That's what all it comes back down to. Mm -hmm. It all comes back down to that covenant. Mm -hmm. You know, and within a marriage covenant, when, when two people get married, and like you're saying, you know, when, Lord, when God said to them, you know, you need to keep yourself set apart. Mm -hmm. You're set apart and consecrated for me, mm -hmm. for no one else, for no mm -hmm. other God. I'm the only God. You're married to me. You're to keep yourself set apart for me. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, when that comes to a marriage, when, when a man and woman get married, it's about a covenant between two of them. Because what did God say? You will become one flesh. Mm -hmm. You'll leave become your one. Father and mother. Leave your father and, and mother to. behind. And that's what that's supposed mm -hmm. to be about. Mm -hmm. You leave your family behind. You leave your father and mother behind. And now you two become one flesh. Mm -hmm. And you go on with this covenant. The same thing is what he has said throughout his word. Mm -hmm. You leave your family to follow me. Mm -hmm. What we were just saying with Yeshua. Mm -hmm. You know, if you leave father and mother and brother and houses and mm -hmm. riches, follow me. You know, Ruth with Naomi. I'm, she left all her family behind. You know, Jonathan, forsake his father. Mm -hmm. It all comes back down and circles around to Yahweh and what he set into motion mm -hmm. for such a time as this, mm -hmm. for this day that we've all come mm -hmm. into. And it always is a requirement of forsaking something else to cleave to something else. You can't have it both ways. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. You can't because 2 Corinthians chapter 6 Verse 14 says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not make mismated alliances with them or come under a different yoke. Replace the word yoke with covenant. 
come under a different covenant with them, inconsistent with your faith. For what partnership have right living and right standing with God with iniquity and lawlessness? Or how can light have fellowship with darkness? What harmony can there be between um, Christ and Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What agreement can there be between a temple of God and idols? For we are the temples of the living God. Even as God has said, I will dwell in and with and among them, and will walk in and with and among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So come out from among unbelievers and separate, sever yourselves from them, says the Lord, and touch not any unclean thing. Then I will receive you kindly, treat you with favor. I will be a father to you, and you shall be son, my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. There we go. You're supposed to cut off your alliances with the world. You cannot have it both ways. You've got to at some point make a decision who you're going to be in covenant with. You can't have two covenants. You can't make a covenant with God and a covenant with the world at the same time. So it comes, the, that, that line that was drawn in the sand at Mount Sinai was, are you going to choose to follow me and serve me, that I'm your God, that you're going to be my people, that you're going to be separate? And yes, it will make you look different than the world. Different is not bad. Exactly. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to not look like the world. And if we start looking like the world, then we've got to do a serious checkup from the neck up to see where we're missing it. Why am I looking like the world? Why am I acting like the world? Why am I seeing behaviors and attitudes in me that are the same things that are in the world? Because then we're not truly walking out our covenant with God. You can make an unholy covenant with somebody. You can. There's, there are you can, There covenants. are two types of covenants. There are. You can make a holy covenant and you can make an unholy covenant. Yep. That's why we were just saying it's very, very important who you become in covenant with. Mm -hmm. Very, very important because right. it can be an unholy covenant and That's you right. don't want to be in an unholy covenant. That's right. You do not want to be in a worldly covenant because that just opens up a whole other door to things that you don't even want to have to begin to have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So like Jordan was just saying, and what he, Yahweh is trying to put across so strongly, he knows this. Mm -hmm. He knows this. He knows the dangers of entering into an unholy covenant. Lot's wife. Exactly. She had an unholy covenant with, with Sodom. Exactly. She ended up being caught up in the destruction. If she wasn't supposed to be caught up in the destruction of Sodom, yep. she was supposed to be set apart with Lot's family. She they were supposed life. to be saved. Exactly. But she chose to look back, and the in that looking back, that, was, that covenant was pulling her back into her previous bondage. Yeah, an unholy covenant that cost her her life. Yeah. And that's why it's very important what Jordan just said. It's very, very important who you enter into covenant with. And it's very important that we remember that we need to forsake all others and cleave only to the Lord. Justin, do you have that video to show? I just wanted to show this video. It's from John Bevere's ministry, and I think it really gives a very good picture of what we're talking about. So that's kind of a um, humorous take at it in one sense because you say that would never happen in real life but are we doing that with God exactly. and when he said we're in covenant with him we gave our life to Yeshua you're my Lord you're my Savior you're going to direct the way in my life Yahweh I'm going to follow your word did we really mean that or are we keeping a bunch of boyfriends on the side that we're still seeing and we say well I'm going to make these little compromises here and there that aren't quite in alignment with the word, but it's okay. He'll understand. No. You're supposed to forsake all others and devote yourself only to God. And yes, he is a jealous God. I, 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 think, I think that Justin had every right to be upset and hurt and say, wait a minute, what's going on here? But you notice she was equally hurt and equally confused because obviously someone had never explained to her that when you get married, this means he is your only one, not one of many, he is your only one. Well, many people are not explained to that when they come into covenant with God. He's your only God. You're not gonna have any other gods. You're not gonna have gods of yourself or, or popularity or whatever, whatever other things in your life could have a place. He is your only God. And 
just so that whole thing, you know, gives you a picture of what, you know, you're talking about. It's like, you know, who, yeah, we, yeah, Yahweh's our God. We're going to live for him. We're sold out to him every day of our lives and stuff like that. But what from our past are we still holding on to? What are we not willing to give up that we still hold on to our path? What, what past, whether it's maybe an old friend from the past, should that old friend really still be in your life? You know, what is that friend offering you? You who have now gone on to a, a new path in your life, and this friend may not necessarily, but you want to hang on to them because of the, the comfort they give you or the encouragement they give you or whatever. But you're not separating yourself for him. So what other things from the past could you be holding on to? You know, it could be anything. You know, old music, old books, things watching on TV, you know, anything. If you're not willing to give them up for him, you've not entered into a true, true covenant. And that's what it's all about when we circle back around and come to the whole thing of, you know, the day he gave the commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai, and the day that Naomi and Ruth joined the way they did, and the day that David and Jonathan joined the way they did. They, they were taking a stand and saying, this is the way it's going to be. This is you and me and nothing else. Nothing else from the world, no outside influences, nothing from my past, because there's nothing in my past that is to. worth what I could gain with you. Mm -hmm. And so what does that come down to with us and Yahweh? Mm -hmm. It's about you, Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Isn't that about an old friend or music I used to listen to mm -hmm. or a book or a television program or even food? Even food mm -hmm. could get you caught up. Amen? We won't go down the food trail, but just going to say, even food, you know, what are you, are you willing to be so sold out to him that you forsake all other things and it just becomes about you and him? And that's it. Amen? And even Paul said that in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. I count everything as loss compared to the possession of the priceless privilege, the overwhelming preciousness, the surpassing worth and supreme advantage of knowing Yeshua my Lord and of progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, of perceiving and recognizing and understanding him more fully and clear clearly. For his sake, I have lost everything and I consider it all to be mere rubbish in order that I may win him and that I might be found and known as in him. So, again, just forsaking all others, cleaving unto Yahweh only. And we say, say like the Israelites there, it's Yahweh we will serve and him alone, but we'll actually follow it out to its completion. And we will keep our end of the covenant because he's already kept the, his end of the covenant, and he will never break his covenant. And we need to be faithful to our end of the covenant. Amen. Hallelujah. So all those joining us on thank Facebook, we thank you for joining us, and we will see you right back here next Saturday.